Pepper Ranch Studio presents an audiobook recording of Ducks Redux, Fueling Flames in Oil Land. The book was written by L.M. Sheba and C.D. Evans. Performance is by Maeve Wills. This book is dedicated to Lorraine McVeigh. Part 1. A Real Rush. Epigraph. If you get to thinking you're a person of some influence, try ordering somebody else's dog around. Cowboy Wisdom. Chapter 1. Sludge and Feathers. Keep your cool, keep cool, stay cool, don't die here, Maeve snarls to herself as she weaves her lime green pickup through a convoy of semis on the last stretch of freeway into downtown oil land. She has driven all night from the oil mines work camp at Tailings Pond and is nearing the end of her mad dash trip to Real Rush Energy Headquarters. The morning sun stings her eyes as she tries to focus between the juicy bug splats. Cool. Stay cool. Words tumble in her head. Dead flippin' ducks. I get blamed, right? I go down for this? Gravel rakes at her windshield from the bare wheel well of a jacked-up jeep. She hopes her crisis training kicks in but fears that she's going down. Ducks lying dead at Tailings Pond. What a disaster, she thinks. Her truck's undercarriage makes a terrible rattle. Must have hit a rabbit or something. Over the roar of the traffic and the tumble in her head of, oh my God, pit bull jaws snap me like a twig. Maeve steadies herself with her breath. She grabs her headset, punches at her jerry-rigged onboard phone system and commands, Dial Real Rush, Harry Jones. Harry picks up her call right away. Maeve, uh, he has no time to answer back when she shouts, No way those alarm horns could have scared that flock off, Harry. Forget it. Couldn't get him set up fast enough anyway. Duck corpses everywhere. She swerves in and out of the diamond lane and past a smelly livestock truck. Yeah, flocks and flocks of them banked and landed right on top of Tailings Pond. What a cesspool. What were we supposed to do? Flap our arms around at him and pray? God knows we tried. A merge moves her out onto the final memorial trail to town. What? How can you know that already? How did you find out? What station? You tell Mailcoat yet? Give me five minutes. I'll be right there. Maeve tears off her headsets and slaps down the sun visor, snatches at the same time for her aviator glasses and pokes out the lens in the process. With one eye closed, she drives head on into the flaming sun toward downtown oil land. She's got a pretty good idea that Harry will give JB the heads up about the dead ducks. Not a good mood setter. Her breath sharpens into a rasp and she catches herself groaning in gasps and moans. Breathe. Steady yourself. She punches at her playlist, takes a big breath, and sings along to a song about calming down and not being so loud. Fat chance she can follow that advice. It took three months with Real Rush to figure out that Lucas was right all along. She's selling out. She'd told him, I'll do a great job at Tailings Pond. Then you'll see I'll dazzle J.B. Mailcoat and his real rush directors with those renewable energy experiments we've been testing. You'll see. Lucas said without a trace of empathy. You're kidding, right? That pit bull will eat you alive. When she accepted the job, Maeve thought she'd be working in the energy testing lab, but instead... J.B. assigned her to chase wildlife away from Tailings Pond. The dazzling presentation she'd planned was likely to turn into, Don't fire me. I have to pay off my stupid debts. Nothing I did kept those ducks off the toxic water. Don't you believe me? As she heads towards the inevitable crunch with J.B. Mailcoat and his snapping jaws at Real Rush headquarters, she drives and chants, Keep your cool, Maeve. Pull yourself together. Do not be afraid. At 
that same time, J.B. Mailcoat, president and CEO of Real Rush Energy, cracks his morning cola and kicks his scuffed cowboy boots up on the shiny walnut desk. He surveys the corporate landscape of oil land and the shining mountains that stretch beyond the walls of his glass palace on the 38th floor. As he sucks an errant morsel of breakfast steak from between his teeth, he reflects on how much easier life would be if there was a big ocean out there dotted with oil tankers instead of peaky mountains and stacks of unused pipeline. J.B. pries his thousand-mile stare off the sweeping horizon and swings his long legs up and away from the top of the desk and onto the floor with a thud. A flurry of dog whines and scratches from a blanket under his hobby table in the corner of the room prompts him to hurl a big old rawhide bone in the direction of his black lab Lucky, who jumps out at it from across the Persian rug with a rip and a salivating snort. J.B. reaches out to scratch Lucky behind the ear, drawling out, Who needs a harbor? Daddy needs a harbor. And who's getting a raw deal? We're getting a raw deal. But a rap at the door provokes barking and lunging that knocks J.B. off balance, upsetting both his train of thought about needing harbors and the pile of coins he had stacked up on the corner of his desk. A muffled voice from behind the big oak door says, Excuse me, Mr. Mailcoat, um, 2,500 dead ducks, um, tailings pond. J.B., momentarily distanced from his aura of command, slides around on a sea of collapsed coinage as he grabs Lucky's collar in one swift movement. Harry Jones opens the door a crack, saying, We're facing a disaster. What do you mean, a disaster, says J.B.? That's what Dr. Wong said, J.B. I'm just repeating. Listen, Harry. J.B. strides across the room, points a square finger and yells out, Chernobyl was a disaster. Katrina was a disaster. Fifty rigs out about 500 days, hitting 50 dry wells. That's getting up there. Who is this Dr. Wong anyway, calling this a disaster? This ain't nothing. Dead ducks ain't even on the radar. As he punches at the television remote, Harry answers, Yeah, I'm with you, JB. The channels flip from the twangy country music channel to JB's default favorites, the Fishing Network, ESPN, Modern Miracle News. He looks up to see JB scowling. You're pushing on an open door, JB. On a scale of 1 to 10, dead ducks is a minus 193. Harry, besides being a pretty good slide guitarist and a native oil lander, is a world-class suck hole. Okay, he sighs. Here's the coverage. Here, he says, on Veritable. The screen springs to life with images of dead and dying ducks and a news ticker that proclaims Antitox's discovery of the catastrophe. J.B., true to his hard, stubble, cow ranching, and oil patch roots of Texahoma, swings into crisis mode. So what are you people doing about these ducks? Tell me, right now. Maeve pulls her muddy truck up in front of the Real Rush building, flips on the hazard lights, jumps out, flashes her lanyard dongle at security, and catches the elevator up to the 38th floor. Struggling to control her hammering heart, she closes her eyes and a scene from the stinking mire of muck comes flooding in. In her head, she has the courage to remember. Oil-soaked duck, bewildered, trying to scream, flapping crippled wings and tail feathers. Ding! Fourteenth floor. Grabbing the desperate thing, slipping and sliding in the filth, scooping it up. The poor creature spraying ooze all over me. Ding! 25th floor. Oh God, the ooze is still all over me. I must smell like a cesspool. Ding! 31st floor. Lucas, pirouetting out by the busted air cannon, holding his camera up over his head, connecting with the veritable press satellite. Lucas, don't wrap me out, please. 
shouting, Sorry, Lucas, I've whored myself out to real rush energy and now I'm in deep. Don't rat me out. Do you hear me? I don't want to go down for this. Ding, 38th floor. Maeve slides past the inner sanctum secretarial sentries, gorgeous in their stiletto heels and butterfly false eyelashes, spots the bronze door plaque reading J.B. Mailcoat, CEO, and barges right through. She's covered in grease, her hair pulled back with a motorcycle bandana and coveralls rolled down to the waist, exposing a tar and feather-smeared tapper light folk festival t-shirt. Lucky, the dog, thunderstruck by her appearance, retreats to gnaw on his rawhide. Hey, she thinks, so far, no pit bull, just a black lab. Not kind, but not deadly either. J.B. Mailcoat spins away from the television, reeling with the twin realization that shareholders' investments are in jeopardy and that there's a strange, disheveled, far eastern woman in the office. He yells out, Harry, God damn it, who the hell is this?